Hello, I'm Oral, and welcome to Speaking About Everything with me. On the program is Dr. Rhoda Arundel. Dr. Arundel, how are you doing? I am doing fine. Hello, and welcome to your audience, and thanks for this opportunity. So, yeah. what? So you, you've been to Africa mm -hmm. recently, right? Yes, last year, last July. Yeah? So, yes. that was the first time? My first time. Yeah, so how you felt when, you, when the plane touched down? Listen, actually, it was like anxiety getting there. And then when you landed, you just felt like a relief. Mm. And then you came out and you're going to, you know, like the immigration section. Yeah. And the experience is like, you start looking around, right? Because you mm. think you know a little bit. Cause you, you think you know. Yeah. But the feeling. Mm. And then by the time you came out of the airport, it could have been any Caribbean island. Yeah. <laughs> it was from there. So how did... It could have been any Caribbean island. What did the immigration officer say to you? I must tell you, though, I get a little scam. <laughs> immigration right because you know to go to Ghana I went to Ghana mm. you you know you hear, people, you hear people talk about visas and passports yeah when you know you know right so like anywhere else you need a visa to go to Ghana with my Dutch passport you need a visa right but you can buy a visa right there on the airport so we who were invited by the government we had like a stamped letter saying that we didn't need the visa mm. so I was like okay I but then they asked so you have to go and show your letter mm -hmm. so that you could go back to the immigration and get into the country, right? Mm -hmm. So I went and I showed my letter and I got it stamped. And then and there were people there buying their visas. Mm -hmm. Those who didn't have visas were there buying their visas. And then I get to the immigration officer and she asked something about the, um, the yellow card. I said, a yellow card? She said, your vaccination. But, you know, I, I didn't do COVID vaccination. I was saying I was told we didn't need a COVID. So apparently your, your vaccination history also needed that, right? Yeah. And 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 I said, but I don't have a yellow card, you know, because, you know, you're home, right? Yeah. I was like, this woman going to send me back because I don't have a vaccination card. And she said, okay, I'll let you pass if you buy me lunch. So I thought she was joking, right? Mm. So I said lunch. And when I realized she wasn't joking, I was like, lunch? So how much is lunch? She said, $20. Mm. I said, you serious? <laughs> and then I opened my, my, my phone, my purse, and I said, and I pulled out everything I had, I had $12. I said, miss, look, I have $12 here, right? That's all I have. She said, okay. She told her $12, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. She stammed the thing and let me in. <laughs> Welcome to Africa. But, but it was Ghana, right? Because I want to say each island, each, each country is different. But it just reminded me of St. Martin, right? Uh, and St. Martin, people are Caribbean people. Like, maybe it was a real requirement. Maybe she was joking. Yeah. And, you know, but I gave her my $12. She had her lunch, and I was in the country, <laughs> right? Wow. But from there, you realize the, the, be, the, 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 the way we treat each other. I didn't feel like you can't enter my country because you didn't have, you know, that kind of talk. I felt like I was talking to a Caribbean person, and we were joking, right? And she said, you know, go inside. But from the time I got in, the guys at the airport, the, the taxi guys mm. are trying to give you a look. And I was like, no, somebody's coming to pick me up, right? Mm. I didn't see my name, so I went to where the hotel had their little shuttle. From there, you felt like you were at home. So they the, the ask you where you're from and everything? Of course, you know, and they don't understand it. They don't understand? They don't. When you say you're from the Caribbean, oh, they, they call you Caribbean. Yeah. And then you say St. Martin, yeah, really? And if they know something about Dutch and you mention Dutch mm. or French, you go like, but if you say you're still colonized, like the Dutch is still physically mm. present, they don't get it. They don't understand why. Oh. <clears throat> it's that conversation yeah. that you had. And then when we went to visit the castles, and when we were at Elmina, I don't know if you know about the Elmina Castle, which is where they would bring the enslaved ancestors from the inland. And then they would store them there in the dungeons and then they would ship them off to this part of the world and so while we were getting the tour you know they're showing you because the portuguese were there for like a hundred and something and the dutch was there like 200 the dutch were there longer than the portuguese but the the name elmina came during the period when the portuguese occupied so and they're giving us the history and <clears throat> those of us because we went there from the caribbean mm -hmm. reparations commission and we were explaining, you know, what's happening in the crib, but we're listening to the tour. And one, the minister was also on tour with us, right? And as we, as we are going by, and the gentleman is reading the plaque left by the Dutch, and he made a comment, I'm standing right behind the tour guide. And I said, yeah, we're still dealing with the Dutch back home. And he looked over his shoulder and he did this to me. He said they were the worst. And the way he said it, and throughout the tour now you understand what he meant. It was, 
it's an experience to experience. It, it, when you're there, you literally can feel ancestral spirits. And then when they take you to the part that is called the door of no return, you choke up because you feel how your body had to be reduced to pass mm -hmm. intentionally. You feel how the corridors were created so that only one could pass. So even if you're trying to rebel, only one can squeeze through mm -hmm. at a time, right? And then they push you out. And then he showed us where the boats would come. He said, you know, because where we were, the, by now the shore, you had more grass in between the sand and the, and the water, right? But he said the boats used to come up to here. And you're standing there and you're feeling it. Um, they showed us the contrast. We had two cells that they put us in. One where they would put like the drunken European sailors who would be mis misbehaving or whatever, properly ventilated properly ventilated and the maximum they could get would be like seven hours to um to become sober again and he gave us the ratio of people that would be in there at, at the time and this is our this is our open courtyard right with a church at the top open courtyard where the dungeons are and then he gave us the one when the ancestors were in and how they would pack them in their 60 at a time and no vent, absolutely no ventilation. And they could be there up to two months waiting for the boat to arrive, whatever. And he, and so when they closed the door, when you went in and they closed the door, you know that there's somebody going to open the door. I knew that. You knew that they have to open the door because the minister in there with us. Mm -hmm. So you know it ain't going to stay closed. But the two minutes that they locked that door and put us in there, it was, it was like over for me, mentally, psychologically. And all I kept saying, somebody go open the door just now. Somebody go. But imagine being in there for two months. You, you defecate, you eat. If you do get food, if they beat you, if you're bleeding, you, you ur urinate. Everything is happening in there. You know, it's, um, yeah. when you think about it, yeah. I always tell people that just like the Holocaust, mm -hmm. there was cameras. Yeah. Just so you could see it. Yeah. If there were cameras at that time, could you know what would have been documented? Mm -hmm. Because it was horrible. Yes. And I brought back a, a video because they created the tour with a narration of it. And I brought that back. And we did a showing just before, when I was here in November. Oh, okay. We did a showing working with Axar and a discussion on it afterwards. Because you really need to see it. You need to experience it. Just walking into the fort, you know, the way it is set up with all the protection so that they couldn't be sabotaged by ancestors who wanted to overrun the castle, yeah. etc. and how the cannons were positioned. Et so people, what I want to, to, to make known about this experience is that the resistance started from day one. The, the first capture, people resisted because people didn't want to be captured. But f along the way, the ancestors and the captives, they fought, they fought, they fought. They kept fighting. They kept fighting when they were in, in, in dungeons. And then the, the part that, that hurt me the most as a woman, they're showing us where the women were brought. So we, they, they're, the, they're the male dungeons and the female dungeons. And the women, so the Dutch um, captain, the 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 the... the, the what was the name of the they gave him? Like the governor of the mm. place, right? I can remember the, the the title he held. But he had so he's so it's a two like a two story and the like the the the, the porch you would look over the courtyard, you could see. And they would bring the, 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 the women out and they would put them down there. And he could pick who he wanted to sleep with for the night. And and then again, you know, if they're they're naked and they're exposed, etc. And there's a separate passageway that she has to use to get, again, no kind of opportunity to rebel or to, and people still rebelled, and I wish she would enter to, and when you go upstairs and you see the lavish space he occupied, and where the, the, the his sleeping quarters, his dining quarters, and where concubinage, you know, would take place, and then when he's done with her, those who resisted, they showed you down there, they would put the ball attached to their legs and then they would show you the pit in which they would beat them away it's horrific horrific uh, so um you went to ghana mm -hmm. how many people went to, with you well we, i went as part of the delegation of the caribbean reparations commission oh, okay. 
and we were invited by the African Union mm -hmm. and hosted by the government of Ghana. So a delegation of a good amount. There were people from all over because mm. this, this is designated a sixth region, right? Okay. And the sixth region is North America, the Caribbean, Latin America. Mm. So even the vice president of Colombia, for example, was there, her yeah. office oh. and she was there. They were part of that conversation. Okay. It's, it's bringing the diaspora in the conversation of healing and reparations for, for, for slavery. You got a chance to eat some exotic food like oh. insects, and so I love that. No, I didn't, you know, I, I'm picky about why I put my mouth. <laughs> but I did try <laughs> the, sure. yeah, 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 I'm very picky about why. If I don't eat it in St. Martin, I ain't eating it anywhere else, right? Uh. But I did try the, um, not the fufu, but, because um, I tried that too. But what, I can't remember the, 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 the meat with the thing, but I forgot mm. Ghanaian dishes all have pepper in them. Oh boy. Oh that. boy. I think it was in the fufu. Yeah. But I didn't expect fufu pepper. Fufu is uh, it's like like you know, you get like the pounded yeah, pounded yam and pounded. So a lot of ground food oh, and then the meats okay. and the sauce yeah. and things. So I was trying the local varieties of whatever they like I recognize, right? Mm -hmm. But then I tried one, but I kept saying, I, I have to remember pepper. Pe I don't eat pepper. Uh, and the minute I start, you know, I start to flare. So I was like, okay, you know what? We're going to stick to what I know. <laughs> no, I, had, I, had, I can't take pepper. I had Olivia here, and, you know, he's in Congo. Right, he was right. How he ate this, um, this kind of, this. Uh, the, the insects, yeah, yeah I nice. saw that. And I, I love No, they're, they're, listen, like everywhere else in the world, you know, like like Asian countries and in, 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 in Africa and in mm -hmm. South America, wherever, there are different foods, like different diets, right? And I'm all, my kids tell me I'm close-minded because, in, like, I don't eat frog legs. I know people oh, that I do. Love I know frog people legs. that do. The nice. French yeah, eat frogs, nice. right? Yeah. My mother's from St. Vincent. They eat iguanas. My kids, oh, that one I don't eat. my kids' dad is from St. <laughs> from Curacao. They uh, eat iguanas. I don't. Mm -hmm. You know, I eat what's in Madden people eat. <laughs> okay. I'm 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 confined to that. I may try something new, but I gotta be in the family of things I recognize. Right. <laughs> That's where I go. <laughs> in case you've just joined us, I'm Earl Gibbs. This is speaking about thing. I'm speaking with uh, Dr. Rhoda Arundel. She's my guest, uh, hair on Hot 99.9 FM radio station, Facebook and YouTube. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Arundel, you you have another project, I understand. What's this project all about? Well, my latest project is my second book mm -hmm. uh -huh, um, um, on education. So you become a claim author. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the reason why, why, you know, I'm going to answer the book question, but a publisher in the U.S. reached out to me. Mm. And so, so far, two publishers have reached out to me, which was interesting. But this one in particular said, you know, we've been following your work. Mm. And we saw that you made a presentation at the Caribbean Studies Association, which I will talk a little bit about that too. Um, and we saw the title of your presentation and we want to know if you have any any um, unpublished work that we would like to work with you. Uh -huh. I felt honored because I said, you know, I, I have this new manuscript that I've just completed because I completed it before I left here. And I said, and I, you know, so we started talking. And, but in the discussion, um, what I gathered, and, I, and you know, they make you good deals, et cetera, et cetera. But because of the focus of my audience for this work, um, I haven't, you know, made any commitment to any publisher outside of St. Martin, because I want to work with House and Hesse, and House and Hesse is my preferred publisher, right? right. For, the, for a number of reasons, right? But because it's St. Martin focused. Because they were telling me, yeah, we like the title of your work. So after I sent the manu the, the title, they were like, we like the title, and we will, they would, take it because it's on education and they wanted to promote it in education forums at conferences and and you know and they would take care of all of that etc cetera, etc cetera. and I was like good deal but I also know that if I wanted them to publish my work in order for me to sell it in St. Martin I would have to buy them and sell them here really yes because that's how some of those publishing houses work. They will take care of all the advertising and everything and the promotion and the production, but their audience is their audience, mm -hmm. and that's where they cater to. And if you want to do something, so I'm having discussions with different people, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm promoting it because I'd like to have it launched at the Caribbean Studies Association 50th anniversary in St. Lucia this year, but also at St. Martin Book Fair this year. St. Lucia is 50? 50 years um, Caribbean Studies Association, and I'm the vice president. And they also have that 
festival there too. Yes, every year. They are, every year they have the, yeah. the music festival that takes place. St. Lucia is doing so many great things. And the thing with Caribbean Studies mm -hmm. Association, every year we pick a different Caribbean island to host the conference. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And guess where the 51st anniversary conference will be hosted? St. Martin? It's good. We're going to be hosting it in St. Martin. In the, 2025. The best place in the world. I, I right. keep telling them, I said, you know, we're going to do St. Lucia. I said, but I'm going to bring you guys to the best place in the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> and that's in 2025. Yeah, that, that, that's good. Yeah. So the title of the book was A World Class Education for St. Martin. Is that it? A World Class Education from St. Martin. From St. Martin, yeah. Yeah. From St. Martin. And, and important, because somebody read the title this weekend and said, I noticed you said from. Why? And the idea of the from is that. The discussion in the book is that we can create a new education model that permits our students to get a global quality education. And you could be from anywhere in the world and get it from St. Martin. Mm. You know, with what we're doing with technology, with what we're right. doing with all the, the resource we already have in St. Martin. The, so you can have a St. Martin online university? You could if you wanted yeah. to. You could, and you know, our kids, and the, the idea, because remember, I'm doing St. Martin, 37 square miles, right? What I do in the book, I start off with um, looking at the evolution of the education models. Mm. Um, because when I was in the Bahamas, I was looking at, at a lot of similarities in the Bahamas. And I was looking at a lot of differences. So I said, you know, when I was there, I was like, you know, I'd like to do a comparison between education in the Bahamas and education in St. Martin and see what lessons we can learn from the Bahamas. Yeah for St. Martin. So the first part of the book, I start off doing that, explaining the, the evolution of these two models. So, and, 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 I, and it's actually three models because St. Martin has two, two sides of education from the Netherlands and from France, right. and then the Bahamas with a colonial British education, right? And then they became independent, and this is, these are the things that they did to where they are at the University of the Bahamas. And I'm doing the same for St. Martin North, St. Martin South. And then what I, what I do is I try to explain where I believe the systems here are inadequate. And then from that discussion, what do I propose as a solution for the new models? But in doing the interviews, when I started doing, because I edu so I'm looking at language also and the role of language as a linguist, I'm looking at, at language. And then I had interviewed St. Martiners on both sides of the island who had worked f in the system from fighting for the St. Martin language in the school space. So I interviewed a lot of people that you may recognize mm -hmm. from both sides of the island that had been doing the work over the years. And then I was questioning some students one day in my afternoon program at Soil about what's going on in school with their language situation. And a lot of them were coming for tutoring in language. You know, and I, and, and, and I remember one of the youngsters said to me, but miss, why you don't put us in your book? Because I was telling them why I was asking these questions. Mm -hmm. She said, why you don't put us in your book? <laughs> you know, and yeah. I was, you know, very, and I'll never yeah. forget her, Nicole. She said, um, why don't you put us in the book? And I was, you know, that's a good idea. Then I started looking at students and I started looking at individuals. So what I try to do in the book is take a sampling of students from different schools mm. with the different experiences in education, but where language was a factor. So I interviewed them. I got permission from their parents for them to be featured in the books. Mm. And so I have students from a range of schools. Yeah individually that are also featured in the book. Let me ask you, um, mm -hmm. the Methodist Agogic Center, mm -hmm. did you focus on them? My on favorite that? school on the island oh, that is not that is funded by government. Because, you know, <laughs> before the Methodist Agogic Center, mm -hmm. you can say the Dutch side education was basically one mm -hmm. unified way of teaching. Mm -hmm. And then the Methodist Agogic Center came mm -hmm. in, and I think we saw a huge change after that. I think it was 1970 and 90, I can't remember the year. Yeah. But I think the late man's James Jr. was involved with that. It was a huge change mm -hmm. in St. Martin when it came to education. Absolutely. And I talked about it a little bit in mm -hmm. the book. I want to see if I can remember where. But what I did is um, I looked at the development of the when it, the Mac came online. Mm -hmm. Right, what was happening before? Um, you have 
um, when Dijkhoff was the Minister of Education in the Netherlands Antilles, how how those developments took place, I quoted them. And then I talked to um, when the, remember the FVPT school too, how that came online mm -hmm. to give this alternative education right. for our students using English, etc. And they came as a high school. Right, right. right. So I talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then there was this, so Methodists would have come in under what they call experimental education, right? Because really? at yeah. that time, yeah, because you said it was one homogenous kind of right. that time, model, yeah, right. right? And in order for that, so they came in in 1976 okay. when um, the Netherlands Antilles was still using Dutch as language of instruction. So I talk about that, how that happened. And then um, they, the, the secondary level now, Mac created what they call the C, what is it, CCSLC, but also the Mac High School. Mm -hmm. So I look at the Mac and, you know, the other forms of education when they came Could in. Could you imagine island. if that school wasn't created in Simra, what would have happened? That's exactly it. And, you know, I must say here, too, so I've been working also with the Department of Education mm -hmm. on this situational analysis for the language policy that they want to create. And... So the book, I did the work on the book, and I talked about the education, the models, et cetera. And then since the, the book, the manuscript was created, I also worked on the project to look at the situation based on what government wants to do. And um, we've had discussions about what that means, a school like the MAC, what would have happened, and, and also the direction the government wants to go with a policy, the official formal policy. Um, that question that you asked is a cardinal question because some of the trends that I'm seeing in education. So something that I, I also researched for the book, I, I looked at, because our system was also evaluated by the Dutch. And they wrote a report on the system of St. Martin education in the South. Mm -hmm. Not a very good report, not a very positive report. Yeah. And it was written, and it's on the website by government, the TWO report. But their recommendations and the solution and their proposals, I believe, are not in the interest of that, what you just said there, and where we are going. Dr. Aaron, I have to go to a break. Yeah. When we come back, we'll continue speaking with uh, Dr. Rhoda Arundel. Dr. Rhoda Arundel was the first Minister of Education in St. Martin back in 2010. 2010, in the new, new system. Yeah. Because yeah. remember, we had Linda Richardson. That was in the, in the Netherlands Antilles. Antilles. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. But you, the first Minister of Education yeah. since 2010. 10, 10, yes, sir. That was a whole new system. Yes. And she's my guest on, on the program. I, you're watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or listening to us on Hot 99.9 .9 FM Radio. When we come back, we'll continue right here with Dr. Arundel. Please stay with us. We are vibrant, expressive, warm, and diverse. Together, we conquer, and now we expand into new horizons, giving you more of the best. Introducing our new Bank of Matico Plus with wider acceptance, purchase protection, and enhanced security. Whether you're online, traveling, or in paradise, experience more with Windward Island Bank. Bank Amatico Plus, more of the best. My guest here on the Speaking of Our Thing is Dr. Arundel. She's the first Minister of Education in the island of St. Martin after 10 10 10. That's a little complicated thing. It goes back, what, 40 years now, but I mention it. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's important to mention it. Uh, I didn't mention it at the beginning of the program right. because I always do it at the beginning. But I think if you do it in the, in the middle part, it's a little easier to because then people think, oh, it's the same show again. No, it's not the mm -hmm. same show. Mm -hmm. All right. oh, okay, but, I got uh, you. See, so you but, know what you're doing. <laughs> but that, at least she's here with me. And we now, we, in the first part, we spoke about her trip to Africa the mm -hmm. first time, going back to the motherland. Yes. And now we are speaking about her other project, which is the book. Yes. And the book is entitled A World Class Education from St. Martin. Martin. From, yes. you know, I mean, from uh, St. Martin. Uh, you bold, eh? I bold. I am St. Martin. I gotta be bold. You know, you, do you remember the pandemic when the pandemic struck? I was in the uh -huh. Bahamas, right? Uh -huh. You saw what happened with Cubans? You saw how Cubans were like saving the world from oh, itself yeah, yeah. because of the amount of doctors and, oh, and yeah. health professionals they could of, export, yeah. Yeah. right? I keep saying that. Um, because people talk about, yeah, independence and, 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 you know, and what is your product? The human resource is a very important product that you can, and I don't want to use the word export as in sale, but if you create a quality product 
that product can go. If you look at what's happening with Caribbean nurses right. and teachers in parts of the world like England and the United States and Canada uh -huh. that are having shortages. And what are they doing? They're, they're, they're grabbing up Caribbean nurses. Yeah. They're grabbing up Caribbean trained um, educators that are going out and working because the product is a decent product. Right. Right. Um, you could create that on a level where if you I'm saying if you change the model that we have and you, you modernize it and you bring it more mainstream, you can create a product that can go anywhere in the world but, but and to be successful. Yeah, but there's so much confusion because I always go back to 1984 when I started this program. Mm -hmm. You know, education is always important to me. Mm -hmm. When I started this program, I said I had three priorities. Okay. Educate, inform, mm -hmm. and entertain in that order. Nice. <laughs> and my fourth guest yeah. on this program was Jack Ferris. Mm. Was then Minister of Education. Mm -hmm. My third guest was Matthias Vogels, who was principal of, of the, the Medicine School. Business College. Yeah. So, to show you how mm -hmm. I think about education, and I look back 40 years now, and we're still struggling. We're going backwards. You say struggling, I say going backwards. <laughs> no, I don't want to put I'm it I'm going that. backwards. No, because uh, here's this here's, here's, here's my thinking on that. If the, the model that we had, mm -hmm. or we have, was doing what it was supposed to do, why are we still importing the amount of human resources that we're importing? Obviously, it ain't working. Mm. Why are you still trying to bring people from outside to fill key positions in St. Martin that is only 37 square miles? If the model was working, we wouldn't have to go anywhere to import. And it doesn't mean that you can't have exchange. You can have exchange, but you're importing, and then you're saying it good and it great, but and then somebody said to me once, and I and I and I want to bring this up because it was an educator that said this to me. This was a European educator that said to me, um, "We bring in things like race into the discussion, and it, and this education system got nothing to do with it." And I said, "Okay, fine, but then let's look at the jobs on the island then, and let's say if the jobs are reflective of the population makeup." If it's not a factor, what else accounts for the disparity between what the population makeup is in terms of ethnicity and what the job disparity look like? If that's not a factor, you tell me what the factors are. Because um, who are the maids? Who are the cleaners? Who are the this? But who are the executives? Who are the operators of, of these key institutions, etc.? If this thing is doing what it's supposed to do, which is to produce the human capital for your society to be successful, why are we not seeing the, the results of it But then? at the same time, when we do have those that are well-educated mm -hmm. and very uh, suitable for the job, mm -hmm. they don't get it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so you can, you can have the, the, the person can be trained for the job, but the system still promotes the way it's designed. I just, I wanted, I have it, I, I, I could read it if necessary. I wanted to show you something that related to this same conversation. Somebody sent it to me and I mentioned it on Culture Time yesterday. A position is um, advertised for St. Martin, mm. head of facilities and government. Advertised, but an ad is placed in Dutch, in the newspaper. That's a policy decision that's going to exclude a lot of St. Martiners automatically. But the, con the Constitution but, of St. Martin states that English and Dutch are the official languages. Right. So if they are the official language, which is why language policy is important, mm -hmm. and you have a policy that says everything coming out, out mm -hmm. should be, first of all, I think English first, but also in Dutch because of these two official languages, right? right? Why is that not done? And then there's a concern St. Martina, an elderly person, raises the issue with the, the, the representative of the, the, the personnel department, and then he gets raked over the coal in a very demeaning and condescending way, like, you know, by the way, if you want, you can apply, and you could send in your application in whatever language, but basically telling the person that, you know, inclusivity, and these new words they're using, and diversity, etc. But you're telling a St. Martina that, you're putting the ad in Dutch only, because he didn't say don't put it in Dutch. He said you should also put it in English because it's in right. because of the objectives of the organization. So that makes you question what are the objectives of the organization? You know, and which organization are you talking about? The other day I met 
a colleague of yours, mm -hmm. now, a former minister colleague of yours, yeah. that served at the same time mm -hmm. when you were serving as Minister of Education. Right. And uh, I'll tell you after the program mm -hmm. with a person. Mm -hmm. And they said to me, you know, the biggest problem in Saman Oji is that we as government mm -hmm. have no confidence in our own True. people anymore. True. But where does that come from? <laughs> where does that mindset of no confidence in your people come Here's from? Here's a former minister telling But me. where does the mindset come? Because it's a way of thinking. Mm. Where does it come from? You cultivate it in the system. You cultivate it in the school system. You cultivate it in the political system. Even when we talk about things like independence, no, we can't go because we ain't ready. As if independence is something you have to earn and only when the school masters say you're ready for it. Because again, we, we have cultivated mm -hmm. a mindset that says you are incapable of taking care of yourself and your own. But so every time you do something wrong down the road, you see, you see what I tell you, or all day to steal a hamburger so I can't go nowhere. Because we still, we still repeating it. Well, they use high tears exactly yeah, all the time. Right. <laughs> they never tell you, look how great St. Kitts is, how grand <laughs> Barbados Antigua, is in Antigua. They use it because the mindset continues, because they believe instinctively mm -hmm. that they cannot. And because they believe it, they have passed that on to the rest of us who don't believe it. But that's, they are the ones in charge of the narrative, but also in charge of the policies. So you keep importing. You know, you won't train what you have to become, mm. what you think yours is missing, if you believe it's missing. Right. You don't allow yourself to see that they have the potential and the capacity. So you have to keep bringing in. Yeah. You okay. but the yeah. system breathes that. When you want to program a people, you use institutions, right? You use media, you use church. Um, you use um, schools, you use institutions, and you do it repetitively with all your resources, and people start to believe it. In case you've just joined us, I'm Earl Gibbs here, and speaking of our thing, my guest is the former Minister of Education, Dr. Rhoda Arendel. She's my guest, and uh, just back from Africa a few months ago. Now and I'm going again. Going again. I so got an invitation to go to Togo. Oh, that's good. And, and, and the beautiful thing about the invitation to Togo, which you know, the prep meeting for Togo is in Brazil. So you gotta go to Brazil before you go to Togo? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> that's the invitation, mm -hmm. you know? So we're waiting on some details, but um, yeah, that sounds, because again, it's this sixth region and the mm. preparation of the sixth region for the discussion, but the discussion is also taking place on the continent, because yeah. you have the five regions of Africa. And this sixth region, there's an agenda. Who involved? Um, yeah, all of Africa is involved in the African Union, but um, no, Ghana, in terms of uh, the prep meeting. Yeah, and so forth. Yes, yes. But what is happening is that Ghana and 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 different parts. So they they keeping the meetings in different parts. Mm -hmm. But Ghana has been like the the funnel through which a lot of what's happening with the African Union speaks. And then over here, a lot of it was Barbados and Caricom, right? And so we are speaking to the region, to Caribbean, but also, like I said, North America, South America. No plans yeah. to go to Kenya? Kenya's doing remarkable well. I would love, well listen, I would love to go, at, listen, as long as they say they're paying for it and they're hosting me, and even when I'm later in a position where I can afford to, I am going. It's, it's you know, I've met people in Ghana from the Caribbean, mm. from United States, from the UK, from different parts of the world who said they ain't going back. Yeah. They ain't going back. I know a couple from Simran right now living in um, and, yeah. um Crassel's daughter yeah, and, yeah. and Lion, right. Uh, and there are a number of people I met people there who have roots in our area that are living there. They're buying a property. Mm. I met one man who told me he has over thirty years. He built his house from scratch. And if you see he showed photos and stuff. But the and there are people who are flexible to move between, you know, the original home mm -hmm. and the you know, but you know when you see when you see video of Africa, you see children starving, flies on the face, big belly, and mm. really slum areas. Yeah. I'll show you the beautiful parts you of Africa. You don't see that, and then you you don't see in America and Europe the starving children with a big belly and this thing, right? Because they, they they live there too, right? Right. They live there too, but you don't see them in, on thing. This is another thing I was because if you're paying attention, to what's happening in Haiti. And um, we have been talking out against it. You see what you see what images are being shown, of what part of Haiti are being shown. You should go and see where Gilbert lives. Okay. You know who Gilbert is? Okay. The billionaire guy in the Okay. Yeah. But here's the thing: mm. when every announcer from the West, every single, I don't care whether they're progressive, they're liberal, or whatever, 
even the places like Al Jazeera that are now covering a lot of these areas, what did they say? The poorest country in the hemisphere. That's, everybody uses that line. If you say that often enough, you get people to accept that. But what I always ask myself, they just were fighting to evacuate 3,000 Canadians last week. Mm. What are 3,000 Canadians doing living in the poorest country in the hemisphere? Good life. And by the way, the, the, the billionaire guy Americans from Haiti are stuck was right born in Haiti in, what, 1934. Mm. He made his billions right in that poor country. Okay, so Americans are stuck right now in Haiti, the poorest country in the hemisphere. Why are they stuck there and can't get out? And some are saying, I, I watched an interview with a woman from France that's living there, from France. She's opened a business. She said she ain't moving. Let me tell you, okay. I, I saw um, a video of a part of Haiti. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked mm. because it's beautiful. The, biz, the, the buildings, the, no, the, 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 the resorts where you don't see like one person yeah. per square mile of sand. Yeah. But it's sad, yeah. It's sad yeah. what happened there. And, but mm. I think people in this part of the Caribbean, mm. they use that as an example as to why we should never aspire to become politically independent. As you a, know, yeah. people will use fear always. When they see it, if you see the, if you know the history, you, the history of Haiti, right? And you see from the time of the revolution, the first revolution where they beat off all the Europeans and established the Republic in 1804. If you watch the history and the development and the interference and the the blackmailing and and the extortion and the well, bringing in of arms, they were also and, responsible for liberating a lot of other countries. Exactly, and 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 they were saying any black man who gets to the shores is a free man. Mm -hmm. So you saw where Jamaicans and Bahamians and the rest of the Caribbean were running towards Haiti for their salvation, right? Yeah. Yeah, just, we, so they were going in that direction. Yeah. It's just sad, though, to, to see what's happening again over It is and sad, over but I believe, uh, um, from what I'm seeing, because we're part of the Caribbean Reparations Commission group, and there's a robust conversation in our chat about what the governments, what the, the governments in the Caribbean are doing, how much they're involved, <laughs> Um, we have members that are on both sides of the spectrum about mm. the issue, about the solution that is being proposed. Um, and they have a very interesting uh, constitution, by the way. People which was written by the Americans, but anyway. Well, it's quite interesting. <laughs> which was written yeah. by the Americans, because of American interests. we got to remember that. Haiti is it's rich in... in public, huh? Right, right. Oh. Written by... The, and, and intentionally, mm. you know. And you have to remember, Haiti is rich in, in, in natural resources. Right. And why... You, when you're hearing this discussion, uh -huh. and all the discussion at the table, at the table, right. United States, Canada, France. United States, Canada, France. So it's such a poorest country in the hemisphere. You think they're doing it because they care about poor people, and they are turning back Haitians and deporting them, and they end the dread land, um, what, a wet land, dry land policy, wet food, dry land. All of those policies don't say that they love people and they're caring, but why are they always involved in the conversations for the solution? Yeah. France, United, and the other countries that are you know involved, but United States, Canada, and France. What is quite interesting is that Kenya promised to send a thousand troops. You see what Haiti, happening now? But the Supreme Court in mm -hmm. Kenya ruled against it. And then now since, what's his name, refused to, he's supposed to be resigning. And as part of the, the, the discussion, the condition is his resignation. Kenya has now said, okay, we were, we take a back seat on this yeah. conversation. So right it's now. quite interesting. But I, I, I want to jump back to your yes, book. Yes, again. yes, yes. <laughs> yes about about book. But we got to um, talk about Haiti. We got to talk yeah. about Gaza. We got to talk about places of conflict where yeah. our people, you know, where there's injustice anywhere, there's injustice Definitely. everywhere. You know, it's just, it's us as a yeah. people. It reflects. Yeah. We. In St. Martin, we ain't talking about Gaza and Palestine, but we ought to be having a conversation. And I know some people try to organize a march, they weren't given permission to do it. And I thought the excuse was lame that was given, but we need to be talking about yeah. those things as well. Exactly. Yeah. So the book now, yeah. you're saying you're, you're working on a deadline trying to get it for these uh, book club, uh, Yeah, for the book fair. Yeah. Because it came out since last summer, when it didn't come out. I finished the first draft of the manuscript since mm -hmm. last summer. And I was trying to really meet that deadline, right, to see if I could do it. And I know it wasn't realistic. But if I give myself a deadline, yeah. I could do it, right? So I produced the first draft so that I could get it out of the way. And now I know I would need to raise the funds to right. publish it if I want to publish it the way I want to. You want to like self-publish? Well, 
I want to work with House of Nessie in one of their packages. Um, why I say self-publish, let me say there's nothing wrong with self-publishing. I've seen people do it and do it well, and I've seen people do it, and it depends on what you want. Mm -hmm. Some people publish because they think they're going to make money writing books. You don't make money writing books. Very few people do. And you have to be consistently writing for that to, so you can make a yeah. living from it. Right. I don't want to publish a book for the sake of publishing a book. Um, I hope to, you know, it could do well and pay for itself, but that's not my objective. My objective is for the St. Martin people to see what I've been talking about, the things that we, people say, yeah, well, you, you're always saying those things, well, you know. So, and, 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 and not only that, there's so much information out there, but it's not usually stored in one place, right, where right. you can see it, you can have it at your hand. So I really want the book to come out so St. Martin people can see what's happening in St. Martin in the education system, yeah. but also to see the potential and the proposal and the curriculum. Now, from that, I expect a discussion and a debate. Let's discuss. Right. Let's, let's, so now there's a proposal. Let's have the conversation about what is good about it, what is bad about it, what we shouldn't even look at. Mm. But we can't have that conversation if the book is not in the hands of St. Martinus. And that's my goal. That's my goal. That'd be good. So, yeah. yeah. Let's get the book out. So I'm trying to raise funds. I'm saying, Ellie, if anybody got an extra, you know, a couple hundred dollars out there and you're not you know, committed to anything, I'm trying to get it to the publisher. I've been talking to House of Nehesi because that's my preferred publisher. Mm. Like I said, I've been made offers. But if I have to buy 250 copies of my book to sell it in St. Martin, you know, because they print on demand, it isn't meeting mm. the goal I am trying to right. have. Mm. I'm trying to get St. Martinus to read this. But I'm also saying here's a model for education that anywhere in the world you can be from, you can use this, or you could come to St. Martin too and take education here and be able to be educated on a level that meets global standards. Well, we will hope that St. Martin will also uh, recognize what you're trying to do here. Um, I don't know what you mean by St. Martin, but I'll say this. I'll say this because I've, you know, you, you I've been back for two weeks and I've been having some interesting experiences. But once it's there and people read it, mm -hmm. it's very clear what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. If St. Martin don't accept what you're writing about yeah. from St. Martin, then that would be a problem. Yeah, well, the first book too. You know, information is there on language yeah. policy and other things. A lot of it has to do with Politics. Well, well, That's of part course. of it. We have a university. We claim we have a university, right? Is it recognized by the government? Okay, I'll, so, are, are you, I'll say this about the University of Saint Martin. <laughs> I have a proposal here on tertiary mm. education, but I do talk about the University of Saint Martin in the book. Yeah, and I make a proposal for tertiary education in, in the book as well. Why do I say that? I don't think I have the answers to everything on Saint Martin. But I'm willing to discuss the solutions. I'm willing to participate in how we solve this. I've worked at the University of St. Martin from 1990. No, I lie. Yeah. I came back in 89. From 1989. Mm -hmm. I have been through every change of administration at the university until very recently, right? When I really had to put my foot down, draw the thing. But so I'll say this about the University of St. Martin. I've said that in numerous occasion. The University of St. Martin has a challenge that has nothing to do with the people that work there. The challenge at the University of St. Martin is that at the level of the board and the structure in which it functions. And if you don't change that, right. there's nothing that you can do afterwards that will give the University of St. Martin the recognition it needs. I don't care what construction you come up because what happens is that every time somebody they hire a person and this person comes up and they kind of like give the workers the you like you solve the problem we need to have money we need to do this and we need to do this and every time somebody comes with a new catchphrase they adopt it and then they go off for a couple of years and they pursue that and then that drops somewhere and then they hire the wrong people and then they have the wrong discussions so unless you change the structure but that, isn't that a reflection of what we've been doing for 40 years that's education? my point that's my point that's why it's time to make some drastic changes you, you may not like my proposals but i'm also saying to you nothing changes if nothing changes yeah but if they don't recognize and and, and really acknowledge and see the, the potential of your, what you're doing, 
then we go back down the same. But we what's continue, the agenda? We continue the same way. You the know? potential of what you're doing needs to fit somebody's agenda. If you're, if the agenda is not aligned, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying. So a Mac school had to come on board as experimental education because the agenda wasn't lining up. But there was that little thing in the law that permitted a Mac school to come on board, for example, because we had that little window. Where tertiary as education is concerned, when we left in 2012, we left a proposal for tertiary education. Up to today, oh, we in 2024. So 12 years later, I've seen people come and go. I've seen people made promises. I've seen people scrap original versions and create something new. But every time they, they, they tell you that the law on tertiary education can come, they're attaching it to a model that does not serve St. Martin people. Well, I, I just hope you're successful this time around. Um, I'm successful all the time. No, I mean, but at least if you have the book in education. Then, I want the yeah. book out. I want people to read it. I want people to debate it if they don't agree. Um, but I believe that, you know, I, I looked, for example, as a part called Lessons from the Bahamas. There were, I list 10 things that the Bahamas did in the evolution of education mm -hmm. that leads to where we are today in the Bahamas that says this national institution called the University of Bahamas is the thing, is the, the, the brain of the, the society. We have given, so the government has given the, 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 the University of the Bahamas the mandate to develop the human capital for the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, but, see, that's recognition. Yeah. But you see, at the same, but that, that's recognition. At the same time, right? Um, you have two radio stations in Simradin that at noon every day play the so-called anthem or Simradin song. The old sweet Simradin right? land. Whereby, when you was the minister of education, you were almost eliminated for that by your own people. Yeah. And that's why I bring that up now to verify what I just said earlier. I hope that you're successful and you said you're all successful, but let me finish. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if that's the case, mm -hmm. you also said earlier that the media plays a very vital part mm -hmm. in this whole affair of informing mm -hmm. the public. Right. If you have these two radio stations, one on both sides of the island, playing that song mm -hmm. at noon, mm -hmm. it's slowly and slowly instilling it. But you will never hear it on this radio station, yes. for sure, because you see, there's a different policy that we have here. Yes. We don't recognize the song. Right, but here's the thing, right? I always say people latch on to what they can when there's a void. Today, as we're taping this, today's... Um, no, they don't mention that. No, no, yeah, but the, the, the what's it called? The, the day of flag and national anthem of, our, of Aruba mm. is on March 18th, okay? So Aruba has a day of flag and national anthem that they celebrate. Kiruso has one also, July, right? So I have just a flag day. Right. So if you want a national anthem, you got to do what you need to do to make it become a national anthem. That was a conversation. So what do the radio stations and everybody else do? There is nothing there, so we're using what we know or what we think is adequate. So you said for your policy, and I totally applaud you because on Culture Time we use another song because there are, there are songs that are out there and people choose a song. This one was chosen, which and I have in my first book I talk about the history of that song and how it came to be played on one of the radio stations and then followed by the other one. But I, at that time, but I know the history of how that came about, right? Yeah, and I know, and, and right. no one's smiling, no yes. one's smiling because before the show mm -hmm. started, mm -hmm. we were speaking about a donkey yes, that died the after dead. four days. Who came to Simran to tell us about a donkey and tell us about our history? Right. I don't know about it, but you was telling me I was surprised. Yes, the donkey is dead. I want the world to and know. And the song is still there. The song is See? still there and the donkey is dead. <laughs> I want Simran to know that the donkey is dead. And somebody needs to investigate how the donkey died. Well, <laughs> yes. Oh, you see? Yes. Well, you're all going to be mystified. What the hell is this? Yes, about? the donkey is dead. <laughs> Check Don Quixote, the donkey is dead. I was just putting yes. it there. I thought it was so interesting. Mm -hmm. Listen to what you told me before the yeah. show started on the yeah. donkey. Yeah. And now with that song, song, yeah. 
Which I think again the agenda, fun. the agenda. Why are you forcing certain things? And but you see, if you say, listen, let's go get a national anthem and let's take it to parliament, let's do it the correct way, mm -hmm. etc. Your very own, as you said, attack you because again, maybe number one, the messaging in clear, but also because there are others who are trying to sabotage it and try to make create a narrative there, right? If you say that. But what the, the the when the agendas align differently, you bring in the donkey, you bring in the storytelling, you bring in the paint the community together. We do all of these things and we publicize it in the media and then we spread it in a way that the people don't realize what's happening because the donkey is dead. They don't realize it because they're all involved in, in doing. They're all doing. They're all doing and they're all doing. Yeah. So there are different ways to, again, when you're programming, you're sensitizing, mm -hmm. you do it in different ways, you know? You ever saw the donkey with me? The one, the picture with me and donkey? No, you got donkey too? Yeah. I have a nice picture, actually. Oh, God, you're scared Where I me. went over to um, French School de Sac. And there were it probably was the lot, same donkey. Lot, no, no, there's a no. lot of donkeys were there. But they and took I, one from over there. I yeah, and I it. took a picture of the donkey. He came over to the fence, and really nice and friendly. It My might have daughter been that also one. took a picture. I hope that's not it. I hope not, but I heard it was a donkey from the north. Yeah. Well, I anyway. heard the donkey was, was well, wasn't it said the donkey was sourced in the north. Well, well, you make me laugh here. Yeah. I don't yeah. like to laugh on the show too much. Well, you need to laugh every now and again. <laughs> But the, so, Dr. Arda, in closing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what do you want to leave with us and tell us about your book? Well, again, the, I'm trying to, I'm promoting the book, but, you know, hopefully it will make the book fair this year. Um, that's my goal. Um, I want to also encourage people to start to look out for Caribbean Studies Association 2025 in St. Martin because, um, like I said, I'm in St. Lucia, I will be assuming the presidency of Caribbean Studies Association, and my goal during the year of presidency is to make what we do at CSA, which is um, a number of academics and scholars, we write about Caribbean culture, yeah. Caribbean life, etc. But I want it to I want it to be more tangible to people, to real people and how it affects people's lives. And so we're hoping when we bring the conference here in 2025, in the summer of 2025, by then we will have St. Martin fully engaged and involved, and we will be flooded by a, over a couple hundred um, in, in, in St. Croix last year. We had over 300 scholars participate. I'm trying to see if we could get five to 700 of them to storm St. Martin, but to write about St. Martin, to talk about issues in St. Martin. And so, you know, we want to highlight that. So I'm, I'm going to tell people to look out for that. All right, yes. that's great. And yeah. look out for the, yeah, the donkey sto series. No worries. If you check my Facebook page, you see a picture of me. I'm going to nice look. Nice donkey. I'm going right. to look. I'm going to look and see if I could see similarities <laughs> in the donkey. All right, good. Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Elder, well, thank you. Wish you much success. All right? Thank you so much, and thanks for this opportunity. And I'm telling people, you know, you know, we're, we're trying to raise funds. I'm going to be on this week trying to talk about it in the media to see if we can get the book launch at the book fair. 2024. It's very good. Awesome. All right, good. And that's Thank it you. for now on Speaking of Other Thing on YouTube, Facebook, and Hot 99.9 .9 FM Radio. See you next time. Take care. Bye. Awesome.